Winston Churchill is quoted as having said, democracy is the worst form of government, except all those other forms that we've tried from time to time. My guests today disagree. They think that democracy, a government of, by, and for the people, is actually pretty good, noble even, and something worth working for. Democracy, ahead on Wide Angle. We speak of democracy so often and casually in this country that its meaning is frequently overlooked, taken for granted. So let's start with a common vision in mind. Democracy is defined as, quote, a government in which the supreme power is vested in the people and exercised by them, directly or indirectly through a system of representation, usually involving periodically held elections. No small potatoes for we humans who have tested all manner of government often anything but ennobling, across our lengthy history. But does our complacency today imperil the government our founders established almost 250 years ago? Joining me to talk a bit about our recent experiments with democracy are two guests. Francis Moore LePay is the author of 19 books, including Diet for a Small Planet, which the Smithsonian National Museum of American History described as one of the most influential political tracts of the times. She has also co-founded three national organizations, most recently Small Planet Institute, a collaborative network for research and popular education aimed at bringing democracy to life. Adam Eichen is a writer, researcher, and political organizer. He is a democracy fellow at Small Planet Institute, is on the board of directors of Democracy Matters, and was the deputy communications director for the 2016 Democracy Spring March on Washington. Both are co-authors of the book, Daring Democracy, Igniting Power, Meaning, and Connection for the America We Want, the basis of our conversation today. Welcome to you both. Thanks. The democracy credentials are significant, so it's, it's certainly an honor. One of the, one of the interesting uh, sidelights to, to Daring Democracy that m not everybody might know is the story of the two of you coming together to collaborate in on it, yeah? You, Frankie, uh, uh, 1966, you're cutting your political and social teeth. Uh, <laughs> Vietnam War is raging. You go to work in the War on Poverty, um, working, I think, for our, uh, the Welfare Rights Organization. Actually, it's very interesting. I uh -oh. was paid by the city of Philadelphia through the federal government's program in the War on Poverty. And yet and yet, my real job was to go knock on doors right. for welfare rights because yeah. this was a program of getting people out of poverty. Right. And how can you do that unless they come together and know what their rights are and get out of their feeling of disempowerment? Right. Amazing, right? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Well, and then, and then we fast forward uh, 50 years. <laughs> Adam is a, a, a college freshman he goes down to New York City to Zuccotti Park, right. Occupy Wall Street movement. That's where, that's where you come of age in a sense, in a, in a political sense, yeah? Um, and then, although separated by almost two generations, mm -hmm. the two of you get together and write Daring Democracy. So if you right. would please, how does that happen? Why don't you start off, Frankie? Okay, well. I have been saying since soon after I wrote Diet for a Small Planet that hunger is not caused by scarcity of food because there's plenty of food. It's caused by a scarcity of democracy. And I've written a lot about this, but in 2015 I said, stop messing around, go right for it. The rest of your life focused on the mother of all issues, yeah. democracy itself. Yeah. And I said, okay, what are you going to do? And so I followed that advice. I think it was Woody Allen who said 90% of life is showing up. Mm -hmm. So I showed up at the first global conference on money and politics in Mexico City. Right. People from all over the world. And there I was at the airport in the rain and this young man was standing there <laughs> going to the same conference. And we began a conversation that I would say has not stopped. Has since not then. stopped since then, no. Fabulous. No. And, and, and on, on my end, it was, you know, I'd actually just graduated from college yeah. uh, earlier that spring. Yeah. And um, I was heading off to spend a year in Paris as a fellow 
at a, a research institute mm -hmm. uh, studying how other countries deal with the issues of democracy. Yeah. How do you regulate money in politics? How do you ensure the right to vote? And so that was what was in my mind at the time. And so I was invited to this conference in Mexico City that was dealing with the issue of, of money in politics globally. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to, to go off on a whim and attend, even though I was the youngest person there by yeah. about uh, <laughs> 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, but I just said, let's, let's do it. And yeah. then I met, met Frankie there, and yeah. I mean, we just hit it off immediately. And we yeah. really, and it, the best part of the story for us at least is that, you know, and I love telling the story, is that because it was a global conference, the, the agenda was kind of set where the median country was. And so they were discuss, discussing things like, you know, what is the best threshold to qualify for public financing of elections? Yeah, yeah. And so th there's a small American contingent and we, were saying, and we were saying, there were about six of us, and we said, what's the best threshold for public financing elections? We first have to pass public financing yeah, elections. Yeah, right. So the conference for us was just talking about things way above our heads. And so we decided to, you know, talk about how do we bring all the stuff we're learning back to America and right. really reinvigorate our democracy here. Right. And then I gather you spent 140 miles walking together. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> something like that for the Democracy Spring March. Yes. Uh, from Philly to, to D.C. And yes. that provided another opportunity, I guess. We, that's when we really became right. friends, yeah. because what do you do when you're marching? You talk. Sure. And we talked, and we talked, and right. we talked, and we actually started writing together then, that's even during the running, march. Yeah. And that was all the way from Philly to D.C., and right. then I sat in at the Capitol steps, got arrested for right. democracy reforms, right. money right. out of politics, voting rights. It was the foundation of democracy. Right. And that was life-changing, because it really changed us on the inside to be part of something huh. and we, we identify as the thrill of democracy yeah. in our book. And, and for your viewers who don't know, it was this uh, mobilization of about 140 different organizations that endorsed it. Yeah. Um, and it was a, a full march put together in April 2016, 140 miles, and then 1,300 people were arrested on the Capitol steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, One and of the biggest ever. It was the biggest, I mean, potentially in a generation or more, yeah. um, and especially around these kind of process issues of voting rights and money and politics. Yeah. And so it really was yeah. kind of this, this breakout moment for what we would write in the book about uh, a democracy movement. So that was really an awakening for us that, you know, despite not not being covered, there really was a and is a democracy movement in the United States right now. Right. That right. comes all the issues together, you exactly know, the, right. the, the issues from environment and poverty and on and on, uh, and the democracy reforms that we need, money out of politics, for example, yeah. are all coming together and saying, okay, let's work together for democracy. Right, right. Now, speaking of 2015, 2016 with the march, there is, there is uh, what, uh, a giveaway that it's not, in fact, uh, a Trump White House that was the major impetus mm -hmm. for this book. Although, mm -hmm. certainly, it would be understandable if viewers felt that, is, that was. <laughs> and, in fact, the book was just published in September, uh, so it was a full nine months after, after the Trump inauguration. Yeah. Um, but you suggest, in, in the book, you, you trace the, the history the arc of an anti-democracy mm -hmm. movement in this country, yes? And you trace it back to actually 1971, a full 50 years before, before a, a, a Trump administration. So I guess I'd, I'd like to ask you to, to clarify for viewers, what was it 50 years ago? What was the moment that started us really on the trajectory that we're, you know, we're realizing this moment now with an anti-democracy? Anti Let me take it. Well, 1971, that also is the year Diet for a Small Planet was published. It is that. And, and, and I never and cease telling that story <laughs> when we go on tour. And, and you have to remember, 1971 was after the 60s, right? Where, right. you know, we were working to end poverty, we working for women's rights, for civil rights, to end the war. All environment, you know, we passed sure. a, Rachel Carson, Rachel Carson, and the, and the 20 Earth, million Americans. 20 million Americans. On the very first the Earth first, Day in 1971. Right. right. Uh, so, there was a lot going on that a yeah. lot of people were so thrilled we were making progress. Sure. But some people were very worried, yeah. very worried. They saw it as a threat to the free enterprise system. Right. And so the Chamber of Commerce commissioned um, Lewis Powell, who was a corporate lawyer on numerous corporate boards. He later was appointed to be a justice in the Supreme Court. This yes, is before yes, that. Yes. They asked him, Lewis Powell, would you give us some guidelines yeah. on how to reinstate the power of the businessman because the businessman <laughs> is the most dismissed and disempowered yeah. sector in society. Yeah. So he sat down on, I'm sure, his old-fashioned typewriter, <laughs> and he wrote 34 pages that 
really read like a playbook of what has happened over time, over right. these decades. Right. What has happened to actually undermine the very bases of democracy itself. Right. And so it's, it's the strategies that he outlines and then some numerous strategies that kind of mutated out of this original plan mm -hmm. that was taken up by corporate America and a handful of, of really a cabal of wealthy billionaires and right. you know, individuals right. um, that created the framework that we argue led to Donald Trump, that Donald Trump is a symptom. He's not an anomaly. He really is the, the logical consequence that came out of this, this movement that we call the anti-democracy movement that has just undermined and delegitimized the systems and norms that yeah. govern our lives. Yeah. Um, and you know, we basically divided into two broad categories, two broad strategies, and then we kind of divided into four parts each. So I'll, I'll quickly go over it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the, the two categories, and it's very important. The first one is manip manipulating the mindset. Mm -hmm. So trying to change the way Americans think about the market about the role of government mm -hmm. and you know basically changing the way Americans think mm -hmm. and so that was done through things like funding educational institutes think tanks deregulating right. media um, and, and, this, and it, this is where the Koch brothers the DeVos family right the where, where they're funding think tanks like Cato and Heritage Foundation which then put forth white papers and policies that you know studies that prove that government is inefficient and things like that really right. trying to change the way we see right. what government can do right. and, and the list goes on to delegitimize government itself which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a bit but the other strategy right. which I'll uh, briefly touch on is rigging the rules of democracy so right. for those who can't um, convince yep. uh, from this, you know, this kind of the free enterprise mindset that yep. you have to turn everything over to the one rule market, which again I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, you just rig the rules so they people can't exert their political influence, right. and so that is you know the things that most people talk about today, which is a great thing that there's public awareness about this. But unleashing the role of money in politics, right. uh, massive corporate lobbying, voter suppression, mm -hmm. gerrymandering, the list goes on. So basically, mm -hmm. one is mani manipulating the way that Americans think. The other one is, for those you can't convince, you rig the rules so they cannot exert influence. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And I just wanted to add here that uh, we talk about this as the anti-democracy movement. Right. We are not conspiratorial theorists. Right. This is all the public record. But a, a taste of that, what we mean is fundamentally these folks, not that they're evil people, but they fundamentally don't believe in democracy. And, yeah. uh, and we show that in the words, say, of a Newt Gingrich, mm -hmm. who in the 1980s mm -hmm. gave a speech and said, what Political life is in this country. It is must be fought with the, with the duration and the savagery mm -hmm. of civil war. Mm -hmm. And your enemy or your your you know your opponent, that's not somebody you negotiate with as an honorable right. contributor. You work to defeat, to destroy, to right. get rid of, and that's not democracy. Democracy right. is coming together, believing that we all right. have something to contribute, and then working out solutions for the common good. That was not their agenda. And I, I think you mark you mark Newt, that that moment with Newt Gingrich as really sort of the uh, the the palpable separation between parties, the the animus as opposed to a willingness yes. to work together and try to create something together. Right. And when when politics is a bloodbath, it destroys the notion of civic life. Yeah. No one wants to, you know, aspire to, to, to do politics anymore because politics is nasty. Right. Uh, you know, especially with the rise of outside money and attack ads. That if you run for office, you're opening yourself up to disgusting ads. Yeah. Like uh, we'll talk more about Deb Simpson, who who ran for office in Maine uh, using uh, public finance, uh, you know, mm -hmm. public financing. Mm -hmm. um, but when she went after Citizens United and a, a big deluge of outside money, I mean, she was. Uh, kind of assaulted with these disgusting mm. advertise, mm -hmm. you know, advertisements yeah, yeah. that really just kind of cheapened her character, and uh, it was really just disgusting. So to engage is to to open yourself up. And sure. I want to focus in just for one second on mm -hmm. Citizens United because that's something a lot of people right. understand that unleashed true. independent corporate and, pro and individual spending. And they think, I actually did too, that, well, these things just kind of arise, these mm -hmm. cases kind of come up to the top, and then the Supreme Court chooses to make a decision. Actually, it was the DeVos family, now uh, Betsy DeVos, Secretary of uh, Education, a yep. uh, huge billionaire family from Amway mm -hmm. uh, yep. Wealth, and they pushed and pushed and had a, a lawyer just doggedly, doggedly taking this case, taking this case on up until it finally got to the Supreme Court. It was a very deliberate strategy. Yeah. It wasn't just any kind of spontaneous emergence of an issue. Right. We'd love to hear your feedback. Email us at wideangle at acmi.tv 
For information about this episode or to view other wide angle episodes, visit us online at acmi.tv slash wide angle. With, with that treatment and, and, and DeVos in particular, her, the baldness that she had, <laughs> yes, you know what I'm gonna say, right? Yeah. So, you know, geez, you don't expect your money to actually buy influence, and she came clean, she right? Which bless it. her yeah. soul. <laughs> right. um, I, and and I'm, I, I would just be able to paraphrase, I don't know, but y yes. Basically we said yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we don't deny it anymore. We, yeah, we're trying to right. get influence here right. by spending money, and that's right. what we all know. It's the big sure. non-secret in Washington, of D.C. Of course. So, but, but then it, 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 it pits democracy against capitalism, yes? And I guess, you know, one, one of my questions is, um, do democracy and capitalism, at least the brand of capitalism that we experience today, do they continue to coexist? Does, um, does the presence and the success, really, of somebody like Bernie uh, Sanders um, suggest that Americans, a, a significant number of Americans, are amenable to the idea of uh, a conversation that includes socialist ideas? Um, or are, are we, should we be aiming for sort of a compassionate capitalism that could, that could better um, walk together with democracy? What do, what do you think? Well, I personally think that the word socialism is kind of a red herring because so many, so uh, yes, many different yes, of definitions of it. Sure. Where I like to focus is that our, our mindset is that there's only one way to do an effective market, and that's with big corporations in control. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the only way you can have a competitive market that really works mm -hmm. um, is to have a democratic government that sets the rules, because otherwise you end up with monopoly in every mm -hmm. sector of mm -hmm. society like right. we see today. Mm -hmm. So actually, a market, a fair market, depends on, it's an ally with mm -hmm. democratic government. They're not in competition. Mm -hmm. They are essential partners. Right. What we have today is the opposite of that. We have what I call a one rule market, mm -hmm. not a democratic mm -hmm. market. We have that one rule. Yeah. is do what brings highest return to existing wealth. Right. So do you know today, Peter, we have now three people in the United States that, who control mm -hmm. as much wealth as the bottom right. half of us. Yeah, 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 yeah. That can't work in any society. Right. Right. So the, the market to work, we have to set the rules to keep it competitive. We have had antitrust legislation mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. worked in the past, sure. but mainly it's, it's the setting the norms and, and expectations that democracy depends on an effective government answering to us instead of the billionaires. Right. Right. Right, this right. level of inequality just can't sustain a, a true democracy, especially when uh, private wealth can be translated into political power so easily. Yeah. Um, I mean, that just can't function. Yeah. What, what, what is happening right now, the current status quo, uh, the two are incompatible, at least right. in the current form of our economic system. Right. And I think one of the most telling statistics in our book is the last federal election, one half of 1% of right. Americans contributed two-thirds mm. of all mm -hmm. of, of the... Of the $6.4 billion dollars spent in the federal right. elections so, in 2016. I mean, that's on, just... That's like, I mean, talk yeah, about yeah. influence. I yeah. mean, that's yeah. extraordinary. And in order to run for office, you have to know someone who's extremely wealthy. Right. And you see that happening right now in the Massachusetts race for governor, yeah. uh, where there was an article today in the, in the Boston Globe that yeah. showed that Charlie Baker currently has more money uh, for his campaign, his 61 times all three of the top Democratic challengers Ooh. put together. Wow. Um, yeah. You know, that, that, right. that is just not democratic sure. when someone can amass that much wealth for their, for their campaign. Sure. sure. Um, okay, so a, a, a basic framework, a basic understanding sort of, 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 of where the concerns are coming from, and now we sort of go to where, where we want to head to. Um, the Trump administration has spent its first year um, scaring the hell out of lives, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it was, it was an attack on uh, Affordable Care Act, uh, deportation of immigrants, uh, undercutting of press, rollback on voting rights, uh, promised tax breaks to the wealthy, and we scratched the surface. Um, it's understandable why the average American might feel disaffected. That we, what, what input could we possibly have against this mountain of money mm -hmm. that is coming at us and, and making decisions uh, mm -hmm. with our representatives? Um, you argue that the anti-democracy movement, which you, which you, again, which you illuminate in the book over the, over the f past 50 years, has been shadowed 
and particularly more recently mm -hmm. by a rising pro-democracy movement. Right. Yeah? Exactly. So before we go to break, I'm going to ask you to just give us a hint <laughs> some, of, of, of some promise that, that this democracy movement exists. I just want to talk about the state of Maine because mm -hmm. it's nearby okay. and they are leaders, yeah. really gutsy, courageous people who have passed um, against all odds. They were said, no way, no how that's going to happen here, and yeah. it did, yeah. uh, passed uh, public financing re-elections. What you have to do, you have to get five dollars from 50 people and that proves that you're viable. And then you can qualify and get funding. So m uh, my friend Deb Simpson yeah. was a waitress in Auburn, Maine. Mm. And in the year 2000, her friend said, Deb, you're, you're a natural leader. Why don't you run for office? She said, are you crazy? I don't have money. She said, no, no, no. $50? $5 from 50 people, I mean? Yeah, she yeah. said, yeah, I'm a waitress. I can do this. And she did. She became a stellar legislator, yeah. leadership on committees, and just beloved. And she was reelected four times. And, and now the state of Maine has the largest percentage of working class people in their legislature. And mm. they have passed. Uh, outstanding environmental protection that has kept lead out of the out of the beautiful landscape there yeah. and yeah. Uh, has protected children from toxic chemicals and products for kids and yeah. a number of things that could never have happened if corporations had been in control. Right, right. And right. exceedingly well-heeled legislators who are not in touch with that part exactly. of America Correct. are in power. Right, right, right. And in, you know, the other thing is just we have the policies that we, we need. We know what to do. Right. Uh, and in states across the country, you know, the states are, for better or worse, the laboratories of democracy. Yep. The anti-democracy movement have made them laboratories for anti-democratic policies. Right. But you know, they are a laboratory for democracy as well. And in states across the country, people are innovating in different types of reforms that have produced results, yeah. really spectacular results that we are so excited to spread the word about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting that you bring it back to that. And so far as the policy exists, as as the food existed, right. <laughs> right? It's just a matter of distributing it and the will. No doubt there are viewers who are interested in learning more about the democracy movement and hopefully are, are encouraged to get engaged with it. Resources, organizations that they should turn to that, that you've you've seen in, in in your years of experience. Well, in in if you're based here in in you know mm -hmm. the b large greater Boston area, sure. I want to just give a shout out to Common Cause Massachusetts. Yes. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. executive director Pam Wilmot <laughs> is an extraordinary organizer, and they are really the, they're the quarterbacks for the AVR fight. Mm -hmm. um, they are just I mean Pam is a remarkable organizer, yeah. and Common yeah. Cause Massachusetts. If you want to get involved in a professional organization doing good yeah. work, yeah. I give my full endorsement to that. Okay. Um, and right. if you're interested in ranked choice voting, Voter Choice Massachusetts is another great one. Progressive Massachusetts, there are, there are a whole bunch of really great organizations. All right. And I should say, uh, smallplanet.org, I believe, yes. is your website. Yes, we have lots of stuff there. Okay. And uh, there'll be links to our field guide, very soon, field guide to democracy.org okay. and smallplanet.org and all the things that. Adam and I are writing and uh, where we're speaking and right. local events exactly. that we have here. By the way, um, yeah. you know, we have a number of them okay. um, often, sure. you know, that people can come to and sure. talk to us directly. Yeah, absolutely. And the Small Planet office, you said people are welcome to come and volunteer. Volunteer. Just Small over Planet. in Cambridge, yeah, Harvard Square. Yeah, right, so right. Very right. easy to get to on the T on the red line. All right. Um, and and certainly during democracy is another place for for people to go. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. We wrote this read. for for anybody to understand and as a guidebook to anybody yeah. who yes. wants to uh, fight for our democracy. It's all yeah. there. The yeah. solutions that we believe yeah. in are all there. All right. You've been watching the first of my two-part interview with Francis Moore LePay and Adam Eichen, exploring the path over 50 years in the making to this particular moment. One many would argue is a low point in our democracy. I invite you to join us for part two of this conversation, which illuminates the growing pro-democracy movement in this country via numerous examples, both across the U.S. and in our own commonwealth, of people and organizations that might yet give us reason to hope and join in. Until next week, and on behalf of Francis Moore LePay and Adam Eichen, I'm Peter Bermudis. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Wide Angle.